Hello and good afternoon. Welcome to course 5163, Partially Dentate Project, Contemporary Management of the Partially Dentate Patients. My name is Avi and I will be hosting today's course. I have a few announcements to share with you before we begin. Please be courteous to our speakers and other attendees. Smart devices should be silenced now, but please use hashtag ADAFDI to share a post or a photo on your social media pages. Fire regulations prohibit standing in the aisles, sitting on the floor or blocking the doors. Please place all your personal belongings on the floor under your seat and do not place them on the seat next to you. Immediately following today's presentation, I will announce the course verification code, which is unique to this course and you will need for your CE credit. Now, I would like to introduce Mick Armstrong, who is our moderator from the FDI. Mick. Thank you, Avi. Um, so, I'm Mick Armstrong. I'm uh, from the UK. Uh, I represent the BDA at the FDI, uh, and I'm a general dental practitioner. So, I only make partial dentures that fit in the top drawer of the sideboard. Um, fortunately, uh, we have two experts today to launch this paper. Uh, it's a white paper, uh, a chairside guide, and a patient leaflet, and we hope you'll find it very useful and informative. Uh, our first speaker is Finbar Allen, who is the Dean of the University uh, of Dentistry in Singapore, followed by uh, Professor William Chung, who is um, a professor of restorative dentistry in Pennsylvania and also runs a multidisciplinary clinic in Hong Kong. Uh, there is a third author who cannot be with us, and that is Professor Angus Walls from Edinburgh. Uh, I'm glad he's not here because Angus taught me as an undergraduate and he cannot now tell you what a dreadful student I was. <laughs> Finbar, would you like to start your presentation? Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, Chairman, for the introduction. I'm just going to switch on the microphone here. And uh, thank you for uh, taking the time to join us this afternoon. Um, I'm, I'm part of a double act today to uh, uh, introduce to you which, uh, a paper which I think may have uh, been circulated around to you and uh, talk a little bit about the genesis of it and, and uh, how we've constructed it. And uh, the title of my presentation is Predictable Restoration of the Partially Dentate Patient from Risk Assessment to Maintenance. Firstly, I, I declare that I don't have any financial affiliations or conflicts of interest to disclose, and I'm not here to promote any particular technique or product. Um, the, an overview of my presentation is, first of all, to define what we mean by partially dentate because it, you can be partially dentate at young age as well as old age, although we think mostly of people in old age, older age groups, but it can happen in young age groups. And think about uh, the lifelong uh, course of treatment required to manage this condition. I um, want to say a little bit about the relevance of teeth to health and why is it so important? Why should we bother? Why do we make a big deal about rehabilitating partially dentate patients? And I think within our own sphere as dentists, it's obviously quite obvious why we do it, but we do perhaps need to, to convince people outside of our realm too of the importance of this, particularly when it comes to funding care. I want to say a little bit about risk assessment and the risk reward balance associated with restorations for the partially dentate patient. Uh, say a little bit about uh, some of the background to what, what actually happens to restorations that we provide, um, be it fixed or removable over the course of time and how does that influence our our, our treatment planning, but also how does it influence our engagement with our patient. And then to introduce to you this, this 3C concept for the partially dentate patient. And, and this is what we've come up with, and I'd like to acknowledge the contributions of my co-authors, Professor Angus Walls and Professor William Chung, to this piece of work. 
and uh, I'll say a little bit more about it uh, as I work my way through this presentation. So for the purposes of discussion and obviously for this presentation, we have defined a partially dentate patient as a person with an incomplete natural dentition where, mo where one, or one or more teeth are congenitally absent. And of course, this, this uh, includes patients with hyperdontia and more severe issues or have been extracted due to disease, trauma, or surgery. And I suppose one of the most immediate and striking things is uh, what a wide and heterogeneous presentation partially dentate patients actually mean, because technically someone with a single missing tooth is technically partially dentate, or somebody missing all of their teeth bar one is also described as partially dentate. So this, this is, is, is one of the reasons we, we've chose to define it in this particular way. So what's going on that influences our, our provision of oral health care? And, and there's a major epidemiological transition going on uh, around the world. I mean, it's manifested at the top level by this aging phenomenon. There's just more and more older people in our populations now. And this schematic here to the, to the far right of the screen uh, 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 illustrates this. The, the dark gray bars are where we were in 2002, and the lighter gray bars are where we're headed for by 2020. And you can see that the growth areas in the upper end of the pyramid, which means everything is aging. So there's a lot of chronic disease and chronic disease exposure, and this has fairly significant implications for the oral cavity as well, and, and indeed our treatment planning for people to try to maintain a functional dentition for life. Uh, there's also a significant inflation of healthcare costs associated with chronic disease, and for publicly funded systems, this means that the competition for healthcare funds is getting fiercer and fiercer. And uh, um, it, it's difficult to keep oral healthcare in the map of this, uh, and we have to try hard to do that. Dental decay continues to be a very significant public health problem. It is described as the most highly prevalent non-communicable infectious disease in the world. And these data are from the Global Burden of Disease Study, and it shows that untreated dental decay is still quite prominent and prevalent and a, a new peak in 70-year-old patients is untreated dental decay. And periodontal disease is also highly prevalent. It's regarded as the sixth most prevalent NCID. And it's not a disease of old age. It starts quite young in the life cycle. In fact, the peak incidence of this is around the age of 40. Uh, so it's a, it's a lifelong disease process. And these are two major diseases that influence whether people become partially dentate or not. Additional issues now as, as, as the population ages are chronic disease affecting things like manual dexterity and indeed uh, compliance with people with cognitive disorders of varying degrees. And I suppose another interesting phenomenon we're now facing too is failing complex restorations in older age. There was a time 20, 30 years back where people it, we're going to lose lots of natural teeth. It would happen around about the midpoint of life, around the 40 to 50 year old age group. This is now really significantly shifted a long way to the right. And it's now happening at 60 to 70 to 80 years of age. And with things like implant retained restorations, now we've been presented with some interesting challenges about how to manage these complex failing restorations in elderly patients. And the influence too, and this is uh, some, something from the, the FDI publications last year, we're looking at how you describe older people. And of course, again, there's a very wide presentation of older people depending on their level of social dependency. Uh, a lot of people are in this area here, so they, they're basically any form of treatment can be technically provided for them. But as you move to the right, it gets increasingly challenging to think about complex care because the capacity to maintain these, and especially with multiple competing comorbidities uh, and difficulties with access to care, means we have to take a more pragmatic approach to management of dental disease and restoration of missing teeth in this group. And this slide, I hope, will encapsulate the real broad uh, uh, set of challenges that we now face with an aging population, where you have people who have maintained a good standard of oral health uh, all through their lives, minimum disease, all the way across to the right, with increasing burden of disease, uh, increasingly challenged by the risk factors that are presented through things like poor oral hygiene, drying of the mouth through polypharmacy, and so on. Uh, um, 
and and the, the burden of the tooth loss does increase and quality of life tends to decrease uh, as you get more and more problems in the mouth in old age. What about younger patients? Uh, well, again, tooth loss is perhaps not quite so well articulated in this group, but it will generally be one of three causes, post-trauma, congenital absence, or dental disease. And of course, dental disease will be primarily dental caries. But what are the issues we face there? I mean, if you look at this rather interesting condition of, of hypodontia or congenital absence of teeth, it has m many varying uh, modes of presentation. And it affects about 5 to 6% of the population. So it's not an insignificant issue. And technically and clinically, it's quite challenging to manage. Um, and, and this is a, a unique in itself, this congenital absence story. But some of the challenges you face, again, about the timing as your know, children become adolescents, become ad adults, you know, the timing and the management of space, dealing with retention of primary teeth, what do you do with them, uh, the complexity of the presentation, be it congenital absence or trauma, dealing with growth, how does that affect your treatment planning, uh, when do you time the, present, the, the, the placement of fixed restorations, how many times are you going to have to replace these in a lifespan? This is a question that's very commonly asked. How long is this going to last? And I think the question actually is how many times are you going to have to have this replaced? Because unfortunately, restorative dentistry tends to be almost palliative. Uh, it has a lifespan. So this is something that has to be discussed early. But as you get also from childhood to adolescence, you get this, this transition going on. And I don't know how, how, how much uh, experience everyone has about this, but certainly in my experience, you know, there's, a, there's a phase usually around about 16 years of age where there's a fight goes on between the parent and the child about what they're going to have done. And you can sometimes as a clinician get stuck in the middle of that. And that's got to be resolved, though, because compliance with treatment is going to be based on who, who wins that, that battle. But certainly the balance of power, as I describe it, shifts as, the, as, as the, 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 the child becomes 16 beyond that age group, in my experience. Uh, in adults, uh, uh, again, trauma, congenital absence, which has not been managed to date, that's a little unusual, but not, not out of the question. But mostly we're going to be talking about uh, dental disease, caries and periodontal disease, but also tooth wear is an issue now as well. And that can be either advanced physiological tooth wear or indeed pathological tooth wear. Uh, and that prevalence statistic for that is around about 20% of the adult population have some form of tooth wear. And with tooth loss, it's not just about replacing teeth, but it's also about re restoring the, the bone that's been lost. So in the case like this top right hand photograph that I'm showing here, Teeth are missing, but also there's quite a lot of bone missing. And of course, aesthetically, that becomes very, very important and very technically difficult to deal with both of these issues with a fixed restoration. Much easier to do it with a removable partial denture. Uh, so you have to bear in mind not just the teeth that are missing, but how you're going to deal with the bone that's been lost as well and its potential impact on appearance. So is it, how big a deal is this? It's actually a very big deal because if you look at this, let me just try to walk you through this chart. This is again, uh, some global data. And if you look to the left, it's the prevalence statistics. So how many uh, people in the population were, sorry, my, it's working. Uh, there you go. This is, is in 1990, and this is in, in, in currently around 2010. And what it's showing, obviously, is the proportion of people who have severe tooth loss increases sharply around about the sixth decade of life. And new cases, this is where people become uh, uh, um, significantly partially edentate, is again around that sixth decade of life. It is dropping, but it's shifting to the right as well. So it's happening later and later in the life cycle. It's a lot of people in older age that we're going to be managing as a partially dentate population is the take home message from this. So what's the big deal about it? Well, it has a number of obvious uh, implications. If you're missing multiple anterior and posterior teeth, there's going to be function and appearance. If it's posterior, it's probably going to be mostly function. Uh, if it's just anterior, it's clearly going to be appearance. But this can have actually quite varying impacts across the life cycle. For some people, it's a relatively minor thing. For others, it's actually a very major thing. And you've seen that, I guess, 
that the reaction to losing teeth varies so much from your patients. And it can actually move over here into these broader impacts like quality of life, morale impact, self-esteem impacts, and even onto nutritional impacts for prolonged uh, severe missing uh, numbers of teeth with poor chewing function. And that ultimately can lead to a societal economic impact too. If people got bad oral health, bad quality of life, bad problems, more and more people taking time away from work because of this has an economic impact on the society. And this is something that we're getting a bit more interested in now is that, you know, does tooth loss have a bigger impact on the development of frailty or untreated tooth loss? There's quite a lot of work being done in Japan in this at the moment in relation to sarcopenia and the development of frailty. This is a dish that's very popular where I currently live in Singapore, the top left here, this is called chili crab. And you have to have pretty decent teeth to chew through this. Uh, so we get a lot of requests in Asia. I think William will say that about Hong Kong too. You know, bakute, chili crab, these dishes require a lot of chewing. So in Asia, there's more requests to replace missing teeth than I experienced in Europe. Uh, it's a cultural difference because of what they tend to eat. So in terms of quality of life, there's no doubt that unrestored tooth loss impacts upon quality of life as well. It does appear to have a broader and bigger impact if you're just missing anterior teeth than just missing posterior teeth. Uh, um, but it, it, it nonetheless, the, the people who keep all of their natural dentition tend to report better quality of life than people who have a partially restored dentition. And one of the goals I think that we've all been trying to do is make our contribution to well-being. And this is a, from World Health Organization. It, it's a sad reflection in life in general. To, you, know, you start off you know, functionally dependent, then you become more independent, and then around about middle age, and depending how close you are to middle age, you push it forward into older age. Uh, uh, that you know that's for later but of course unfortunately there's a decline uh, there's a functional decline with aging the big question is is how, when does it become disability and the well, goals of healthcare now are to try to keep as many people as possible above that disability threshold and in oral health we can make a strong contribution to that because it's not just about functional it's also about the quality of life aspect so this is why I think this is a fundamentally important question. How do we restore people to have a functional dentition that helps them to keep a, a decent standard of functional capacity in, in, up to the end of the lifespan? That's the big challenge for us at individual level and at societal level as well. So these are the sort of questions I think we have to ask ourselves that, you know, we, I think we know what we desire, but we have a lot of challenges to trying to achieve it because uh, at the top, you've got people with increasing risk exposure through the life course, meaning that your risk of losing teeth will increase as you get older. That's, that's, a, that's a fact of life. Attitudinally, there's going to be an influence of this. Um, and then what people are capable of maintaining is going to be a, a, a part of the equation that determines how big and, and how many teeth you're going to lose over the course of your lifespan. So this is what we want to try to achieve, but how are we going to do it? So we have to look at risk. We have to look at the capacity of the patient to undertake appropriate maintenance. Uh, we should try as much as we can as healthcare professionals to reduce that burden of maintenance. We need to understand clearly the patient's requirements and expectations. And this is a big bear trap in my experience. And it's a, the biggest bear trap of all is when someone is going from a removable denture to an implant retained restoration. There's a well-known phenomenon in psychological uh, literature called response shift. And that basically means is that people will not judge their new prosthesis by the same uh, yardstick that they, they judge their older one. And you can get caught out with that. You think that you're giving them you know, this tatty old partial denture, you're giving them nice implant retained restoration, and then find that they're quibbling about small aspects of this, which is, comes as a surprise. It's, it's, it's kind of an explainable phenomenon. It's called response shift. So we need to clearly understand their expectations of care, not just in the short term, but in the long term as well. The other thing I find interesting of being, being practicing a prosthodontist for nearly 30 years now is how we talk about permanent restorations, uh, how our patients expect what we give them to last a lifespan. If they buy a car or a television or a computer, they don't expect it to last. So why do they expect our restorations to last a lifespan? And is that part of the communication that we have with our patients? And I don't think it's helpful to use terms like permanent restorations in this regard. 
and planning for future failure and, and age and circumstance appropriate intervention as well. And I think one of the things we have to be doing is to not think about the short term, but think about the what if scenario 10 years down the line, if that tooth is lost or if that implant is lost, what is going to be the consequence of that? And do we have a rescue plan for that? Because our patients in practice will come back seven, eight, nine years down and say, you gave me that implant back then and now you tell me it's failing and the whole thing has to be redone. Um, it would be better, obviously, if your rescue didn't require a major intervention, if at all possible. So some of the things we have to think about are to restore or not restore. That is the question. Uh, there's no doubt, I think, that there are benefits to restoring gaps, but there are consequences of that too. We talk a lot about biological price, there's mechanical maintenance issues as well. So is the risk of these worth paying to get the functional benefit or not, as the case may be? So that's the sort of thing you have to ask, because once you start to put a restoration into someone's mouth, you start a restorative cycle, which is ongoing it's going to have to be changed periodically. And obviously the longer that cycle or the intervals in the cycle you can get, the better. So in terms of planning issues, especially with older patients, what do they want and what are they willing to accept? Critically, are the risk factors for disease under control? In my experience, this is a common problem. People treat the space and not the patient. They don't get the risk factors for ongoing tooth loss under control or at least the patient doesn't, but they may not have had the right advice from their dentist either. So that, that is a critical question. Are damaged teeth restorable, particularly if we're going to use them as abutments for a fixed restoration? How many teeth are required to stabilize our occlusion and what are the limitations? And critically, are they capable of maintaining what we give them? Because there is a maintenance cycle, which I'm going to talk a bit about later on. So here's a classic case in point, someone in middle age started off fully dentate. The first uh, radiograph in this cycle started off with a molar endodontic procedure being required for tooth number 16. And about 15 years later, this is where she is at. This is now gone. This is about to go. And this is questionable here as well. So arguably, the, you know, this patient has been treated sequentially for various problems episodically as they've happened, but there's been no long-term risk analysis of, of what's going on in this mouth. And she's well on her way to substantial tooth loss by the age of 60. Another example here, uh, somebody bizarrely enough has had what looks like a complex implant restoration placed, but I don't, wouldn't like to bet my mortgage, which is very substantial, on this tooth or these ones either. A uh, classic case, I think, of treating spaces. And you zoom up here and you see this is going on. So there's all sorts of bad stuff happening here because he's treating a space, not the patient. So I think we've got to get better and more systematic about how we assess risk. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a common issue. How, how, how systematic should we be? How should we do it? Um, and a lot of dentists say to me, but we don't get paid to do that as part of our treatment if, if we're using public payment schemes. It's not on many uh, insurance policy programs, and maybe this is something we should be arguing for a bit more. Um, because there's no doubt that the treatment strategy for this patient is going to be very different for this patient, and they're in the same sort of age group. And the interesting one is this one here. Uh, where you know, you, there's a preference for tooth conservation, but there's ongoing disease challenges, it's moderate risk, there's pretty good motivation. But you know, what's going to happen in this mouth over the next five to ten years? And if it's not assessed with a long-term view, then I think we're going to run into a lot of problems. So there are all sorts of various forms. To be honest, I'm not a particular advocate of any particular system. Uh, but I do strongly encourage people to be systematic in their approach to risk assessment and to try to categorize a patient's level of risk. And that should inform your next course of action, whether you try to hold the line at trying to improve their risk level or you accept that they're not going to improve and you take a, uh, perhaps a more pragmatic course of action, such as transitioning a patient towards the dentate state in the extreme example. There are some uh, clear examples we can look at. For example, root caries, we, we know pretty much what are the risk factors. And the more of these risk factors the patient has, the more likely they are to have this recurrent root caries disease process ongoing. 
Uh, um, we know that if a patient's had a, a lot of history of root caries, they're very strong risk predictors for future root caries activity. And this will be an ongoing challenge. So we can do simple things like if we're providing a patient with a removable partial denture, oops, what's happened here? Oh, there it goes, it's okay. Removable partial denture. The very last thing we should do is cover these exposed root surfaces with a connector. So it has to be designed well clear of all of these. If we put a, a lingual plate connector over these teeth, I can guarantee you they'll be covered in root caries within months. So this is something we can have to be very careful with ourselves. We can also uh, categorize people according to level of risk. You know, there's a slightly complex logarithm called the karyogram, which feeds in a lot of biological and social and, and, and clinical data, but it can, it can categorize your risk level as your chance of avoiding new decay. And this is a prospective study where we did this in an elderly group of people. And it was quite predictive. The patients that we thought were, were, you know, were, were high risk of dental decay were the ones, in fact, who did get new de root decay at, at 24 months. And those we categorize as low risk, very few of them did. So you, you, you can actually almost predict what's going to happen based on the number of risk factors the patient presents to you. And I would venture to you that the management strategy for low risk is very different to the management strategy for a very high risk. And certainly high risk, you have to think very carefully about introducing any kind of prosthesis into that mouth, particularly a removable one. A lot of patients have a desire to avoid removable dentures. That's not unreasonable, I guess, but we should be careful about that because if we just sit on the fence and watch things happening slowly over time uh, and the mouth deteriorates, we start to run into almost the prosthetic nightmare zone. Uh, I don't know about you, but the, the loss of uh, old mandibular teeth against a, a natural upper dentition, I've never successfully restored that with a removable prosthesis. Uh, this case here where your know, patient's tongue has started to expand, it's filling all the spaces where the teeth used to be. They lose those teeth. Now, how are you going to re restore them? Because they've had no training whatsoever in how to wear a removable prosthesis. So I would strongly advocate you do not sit on the fence with this. You have to decide if this patient is not going to be able to maintain this dentition, it's not going to reverse with treatment, you need to plan long-term for that patient being edentate, not wait till all of the teeth suddenly have to be removed and toss a coin in the air and hope for the best, because that's about as predictable as it gets if you, if you transition too late. What about posterior tooth replacement? Uh, this is an interesting one. I mean, we have a variety of ways that we can look at this. We can do our traditional partial denture design. We can maybe do a shortened arch and extend it a little to give a, a few more occlusal contacts. We can go implant retain restorations and there's pluses and minuses with all of these. Uh, I think with a denture, one of the interesting ones is the compliance issue. Uh, with this, obviously, it, it's certainly more costly, and this is accepting a suboptimal rather than a, a, an optimally restored dentition. So, how do we choose? The shortened dental arch concept was proposed many years ago as a means of restoring a, a suboptimal but functional dentition, particularly for older people. Now, generally speaking, you know, it's very rare to get someone like this. You're more likely to see someone who's lost a couple of teeth along the way and you need to, to restore these uh, uh, visible spaces somehow or other. But there are varying reports on this. Uh, and I think there are some cultural differences. If you look in Japan, uh, where they compared uh, a restoration with, and no restoration, uh, the restoration group did better in terms of quality of life, but I, I do uh, caution that there was no between group comparison here and it was not a randomized trial, which weakens the evidence here. In the Netherlands, there was no difference uh, except when uh, missing teeth were replaced or were missing anterior teeth were replaced. And in Germany, there was no significant difference either. So, so uh, uh, th I think the trend line seems to be that basically both of these treatment strategies work. Uh, the group I led in Ireland looked at this issue as well in a randomized clinical trial and we measured a number of different parameters but one of the things we were looking at was the quality of life issue measured using this particular measure here. There's a slightly fussy slide I'm going to show now and I want to draw your attention to the blue line 
and the red line. So the blue line is the, the group who restored with a partial denture and the red line were those who had a functional dentition restored to a shortened dental arch. Both groups improved significantly after the treatment and for the first year or so they were pretty much even. But there's a gap now beginning to uh, stretch between the two of them at two years, which is actually significant. So the quality of life has remained stable in the short and large group, and it's now starting to deteriorate in the removable denture group after two years. So the question is, why is that? What's going on that's leading to that change? Well, I guess one of the main benefits, uh, if you have these Kennedy one or two dentures with no modifications, potentially stabilizing a complete replacement upper denture is one of the main benefits, because you can see this is probably going to be unstable with such a shortened arch. Obviously, if you add some anterior teeth in, that will address the aesthetic complaint. So there's certainly benefits there. But 40% of people don't wear these dentures provided for them. Now, why is that? Is that because the solution is worse than the problem? Or is it, yes, we'd like something done, but we don't like this approach? It could, it could be either. We're not too sure to tell you the truth. But one of the things I think that does happen is that people provided with removable prosthesis will start to see a deterioration fairly quickly. Uh, the tissues will change underneath, so the denture tends to sink and the occlusion is not so tight as it was when you first made it. Over time, there'll be some wear and tear of the teeth as well. Uh, and so I think that the, 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 the trend line, as I say, is that after about two years, the benefit of, of, of a denture to, to quality life and chewing function starts to deteriorate. Um, so so th does this influence satisfaction? It probably does, uh, I would say. The other thing I just wanted to draw attention to here is the poorly maintained denture and the damage it can do. Um, so I think you know, one of the points I'm going to raise later is the issue of maintenance and monitoring, which I think is very, very important. Because one of the things that there's absolute consistency about in the literature is that you introduce a partial denture into someone's mouth, uh, the plaque score will increase automatically. So it, it's very important to recognize this and to be proactive in talking to patients about this and showing them, even using things like plaque disclosing uh, uh, agents on the denture to show them actually where the problems may lie. Uh, because they will always claim, of course, that they're brushing their teeth twice a day and doing all the right things. But the proof actually comes when you do your plaque disclosing tablets and there's that ah moment uh, when you show them, well, actually, it's not so good, actually, and you have to do a little bit better and talk to them about that. This is just, again, just to illustrate this point with some data, uh, some work from Japan, where uh, I guess the, the school in Osaka is, where, is, is a very good school. So one assumes that they make partial dentures to a very high standard. Uh, uh, and these are cobalt chromium based. They were not tissue borne acrylic based dentures. And the survival of abutman teeth, and there was over a thousand of them over a seven year period was observed. One of the ways of categorizing these data was according to the uh, maintenance program the patient was assigned to. So there were three possibilities. They, were, they had a maintenance program every three to six months. They had an annual program or they had no program at all. And the diagram on the far right is a survival curve, and it shows that around about the four-year period, teeth started to fail quite dramatically. And the two lines here are the ones, obviously, where things are pretty bad, and that's this, these two groups here. The top line was significantly better in terms of survival of teeth, and that was this group. So I guess the take-home message is that a tailored maintenance program, when people are provided with partial dentures, extends the survival of the teeth. And bear in mind that partial dentures will tend to be provided for people who have a higher risk level for tooth loss. Uh, uh, this is really, really important, I think, if you want to get a decent lifespan out of the teeth around a denture. The other, there, there are many different risk factors, again, that we're aware of uh, for survival of abutment teeth or teeth close to a denture, you know, prime root ratio, pocket depth, endodontic treatment of an abutment, etc., etc. There are many of them. But how do you use this information to help your treatment plan? Well, again, looking at the same data in the same study, uh, looking at the survival of teeth after partial denture provision, the first thing is that you can identify straight away is the ones that are the highest risk of failure are the direct abutment teeth, the ones that, like, that are used as clasps or as precision attachments. 
followed by the non uh, the, uh, the indirect abutments and then by non abutments. So obviously your focus of attention should be very much directed at these to try to improve this stat. Um, a couple of areas, if the tooth is, uh, the abutment tooth is endodontically treated, it is a three times risk of failure higher than a non endodontically treated abutment tooth. If there's already been a lot of, of attachment loss and the crown root, root ratio is unfavorable, again, about a three times the risk. So how does that influence your, your planning? Do you use that tooth? Do you alter that tooth in some way, maybe to convert it to some form of overdenture abutment? What do you do? Uh, do you use it and say, well, within three to four years, this is going to fail and we can have a rescue plan that doesn't mean a brand new denture again? There's a few options that we have to think about. So this is just essentially saying the same thing, that the more uh, uh, periodontal attachment loss you have, the more likely the tooth is to fail. So what about the impact on quality of life of fixed restorations? Broadly speaking, it's positive, but is it any better between implants and conventional uh, tooth retains? We don't have the data, we don't know actually, but it, it certainly improves things. Does it improve chewing? Yes, probably. And uh, patients who are missing a single molar like this uh, will probably ask for something to try to improve their chewing. But one of the things we've got to be careful about is, again, not stretching the envelope of, of uh, fixed prosthodontics too far. Uh, using multiple teeth as abutments, uh, using root canal treated teeth in the middle of all of this, it's only asking for trouble. And of course, the the hygienic design, which is not evident in this case, uh, is really bad for the periodontium. Other areas that we now have to think about too, of course, is there's so many different materials now that we can use to make uh, conventional fixed partial denture or fixed bridge restorations. So this systematic review kind of delved in and tried to wade through the, the information. And it would appear that we still have the highest survival rates for standard metal ceramic fixed partial dentures compared to our uh, other, other all, uh, ceramic uh, or zirconia all, uh, alternatives. Uh, incident caries is significantly higher in abutment teeth with the densely sintered zirconia abutments or uh, uh, bridge work. And mechanical complications are much higher in the glass ceramic and glass infiltrated alumina uh, rest based restorations. So that's something we should be aware of. Implant retain restorations. Uh, we have a few issues to consider, like in a younger patient post trauma, uh, um, it's attractive to give them a long lasting restoration uh, uh, rather than a removable denture. But there are a number of variables in the case where there's a lot of bone missing, as well as the teeth. You know, we have to factor in the, the uh, if we graft this tissue, this area, there's a failure potential in the grafting as well as the, the restoration itself. And systematic reviews would suggest that mechanical uh, uh, issues with implant retained restorations are quite high, uh, uh, that uh, only 65% or 66% of patients are free of any complications after five years. And most of these are mechanical, but a growing tidal wave is this issue of peri-implantitis. And I'll come back to that in just a moment. Uh, because again, uh, you know, as we've traded some of our, our aesthetic value, uh, against our biological value, we start to run into problems of how to maintain these. They're quite complicated to maintain, even though they might look quite nice. And sure enough, uh, we, we're seeing this, this tide more and more. And we're seeing peri-implant disease in, in patients with history of periodontitis, with poor oral hygiene and smoking. But only 28 to 56 percent of people who have implants uh, uh, will, will, will experience peri-implant disease. Um, and so that, that's quite a stark statistic and something I think in the implant world we're trying to come to terms with more and more. How do we, how do we deal with this? And this is a classic example. Again, somebody who has a history of periodontal disease, they're keen to maintain, but they've lost this big fi fixed restoration here. They've had an implant retained restoration and two implants to replace it. Um, but uh, uh, stressful occupation, it's a cement retained prosthesis, which brings its own challenges. What's happening? She's starting to develop after four years uh, peri implant disease around one of these implants and has already lost about five millimeters of bone. So the long term prognosis for this implant, I'm afraid, is not so good. 
It can happen in young patients as well. Uh, uh, this is patient is a congenital absence of teeth uh, uh, restored with implant retained crowns, but again, poor oral hygiene uh, um, and is starting to, to lose the bone around this implant here. There is an issue too about perhaps a deflective contact affecting this, but it's not helped at all by poor oral hygiene. And again, the, the literature is now strongly suggesting that we have implant maintenance programs as well. And the optimal period, as far as we can tell, is about every six months uh, uh, we have to go down this road. We should also ask ourselves the question, are we starting to get into the habit of treating periodontal disease with dental implants? And this, I think, was quite a useful paper to take a look at, published a couple of years back. But basically, an av advocacy for good periodontal disease management through traditional periodontal therapy, rather than reaching for the implant kit as soon as someone has got periodontal disease. Because we know that peri-implant disease uh, uh, is, is much more common in patients with a history of chronic periodontal disease. So with all this in mind, this is our proposal, the collaborative care continuum. And we emphasize the three C's because we think that it's about care rather than treatment. Uh, we, we believe it's collaborative because it's, it only works if both patient and dentist are working collaboratively with the patient's interest in mind. And maybe specialists and generalists working collaboratively with the patient as well. And it's a continuum because it cannot be episodic. It's gotta be part of long-term care. Uh, you know, there may be a cycle of where we're providing restoration, but there's care beyond the provision of that restoration, which we believe is essential. And it's based upon these three pillars. Uh, Pre-treatment assessment must be comprehensive and include all of these elements that I've highlighted as I've gone through this presentation. There are a variety of treatment options which we have to decide are they, and which of these is most appropriate. And if there's more than one appropriate, how do we choose and how do we get the patient's input? And is there a clear personalized care plan then to help maintain this beyond the lifespan? All of these three elements we believe to be very, very important and must be considered as a collaborative care continuum. And we ask the question, why replace missing teeth? And, and look at things like indications, the patient's perspective on this, what are the main risks, what are the main benefits, and we weigh these up together. And how then? So we're looking at the technology available, what are the indications, what's the patient's perspective on this? They have to have an input. What are the main risks? And what do we think is the average lifespan based on the evidence that we currently have to date? So just a couple of examples of this. This is a young patient who lost teeth to trauma. Uh, otherwise, very well motivated, good hygiene, very low dental disease, experienced non-smoker, no medical history. Uh, so all good indicators. Uh, we could probably do a denture or an implant retained prosthesis. It's a young patient with low disease risk. So obviously an implant retained restoration was the treatment of choice. We've reinforced the hygiene messages. Uh, regular maintenance will be required to keep an eye on this. Recommended the sports guard because he was involved in sports. Lifespan, how long is it going to last? It's not going to last his entire life. It's going to have to be replaced again down the line. But the lifespan will be certainly extended by uh, uh, his ability to maintain this and how carefully we're checking it. Uh, patient with hypodontia, again, some issues here about uh, spacing. How do we manage those? Congenital absence complex to try to deal with space management here. Do we use orthodontics or not? Uh, the decision is to close up some of these spaces, but not fully these space. But is it a denture? Is it implant re uh, tooth retained bridges? What type of it is? Is it, is it conventional, very destructive? Is it adhesive? We don't know how long they will last in small teeth. So probably implant retained restorations gives us the best long-term prognosis. The patient has had a lot of input into this because they've got to go through the process. Uh, um, and again, monitoring for orthodontic relapse uh, is an additional element in these cases after orthodontic tooth movement. So you go through the process and, and implant retain restoration, and this is four years later, and the patient's maintaining this nicely and has continued to come back for his reviews. An older patient, uh, a history of periodontal disease, which is a, is a slightly amber risk, um, but well motivated, uh, but the disease experience is reasonably significant, has diabetes, but it's well controlled. If that was not so well controlled, this would be a negative risk indicator. 
so how do we do this? Do we give her a partial denture because she's missing this unit? So there's an aesthetic issue, uh, but that's going to create a lot of maintenance problems. Implant retained prosthesis or maybe short arch approach. In her case, she felt that she did need back teeth to chew. So she was prepared to have an implant retained restoration, accepting some of the risk uh, associated with this periodontal disease experience, but it's well maintained and well controlled. It will need to be ongoing supportive therapy afterwards. Um, so this approach was taken using fixed restorations. A patient with tooth wear, another challenging type of case, but they also have periodontal attachment loss. So the occlusion is unstable, uh, not enough units to stabilize this, uh, missing quite a lot of teeth, uh, quite a bit of bone loss, but is well motivated again, non-smokers. So some of the prognostic indicators of long-term disease management are good. Again, we have a range of options. We, you know, complete rehabilitation, he wasn't so keen on because he didn't want very complex treatment. Uh, so the treatment that here was chosen was to try to go for a, an overlay type of partial denture with some composite resins. He's accepted that these resins will need to be remodeled and resurfaced periodically, and there may be a need to replace the denture maybe every five or so years. Uh, and he will need to commit to maintenance because he's got periodontal disease every three to six months. That maybe can go to six months once we're satisfied this disease process is stabilized. And that's where he's at now. Another patient with, sorry, uh, with, with uh, uh, quite a lot of teeth missing, uh, um, dentition starting to fail in the anterior dentition. Uh, the, the amber risk here is not highly motivated, not so great oral hygiene, but a high disease experience and a smoker. So how are we going to do that? Again, there's a range of options, but we're probably not looking at complex treatment here. Patient is relatively young, she's in her 50s, she does not want to lose her remaining upper dentition and is looking for ways of keeping as much as she can because she feels she's already lost too much. So stabilizing this, the approach taken is some magnetic uh, copings here and a simple overdenture, which is partly retained on these copings. Uh, uh, and again, this is maintainable. She's committed to a high risk maintenance program every three to six months. Also, I think we do have a role in smoking cessation, so we have to give smoking cessation advice as part of our care package as well. As well as the general health effects, it has positive oral health effects as well. And then the final example is just a younger patient with a big history of disease, uh, not highly motivated, poor oral hygiene, high disease experience. He's in the red zone. He's not that concerned. So if we sit and watch this, this is just all going to crumble away, and then he may have a problem. Uh, which we may not be able to restore properly. So we're moving on for this patient into a transitional denture. And this has just been made just to stabilize him presently. And he's committed that he will have gradual extractions of teeth and added to this denture over time. Uh, and that suits him because he's not highly motivated for complex treatment. It's better planning because we're helping him hopefully make a success, successful transition to being edentate. So just to summarize, uh, we have a rapidly growing number of partially dentate patients. Uh, many of these are going to be probably in their 60s and 70s, because uh, that, that's where the peak incidence and prevalence of se severe tooth loss currently lies. Over time, that's probably going to move into even the older age groups. There are many different options and the prognosis varies a lot. Uh, it depends a lot on the individual circumstances of the patient that you're dealing with. So I think it's important that we tailor our choices to that particular patient's circumstances, their desires, their expectations, and what, what biological processes are going on in their mouth. No one size fits everybody. Uh, uh, that's certainly true. But I think it's very, very important that aside from the textbook approach to making a prosthesis, we do make the patient own their care. They, they have to take responsibility for their part. If they don't do their part, our part will fail and it will fail pretty quickly. So that's very, very important and hence our emphasis on collaborative care because the patient must play their part. They need the right information. They need the basis to, to play their part. And you need to help them with this and check them to see, are they able to comply? It may not be attitudinal, it may be physical in an older patient as well. So you have to continually check and recalibrate this. 
Because maintenance, I hope I've convinced you, is very critical. If a patient cannot maintain uh, good quality uh, plaque control, whatever we provide, no matter how fancy it is, is going to be time limited quite quickly. So we recommend the 3C pathway as a framework for this, uh, for, for helping to conceptualize and plan care for people who are partially dentate. And with that, I'd like to thank you. Greetings from Singapore. And this is our new dental school, which we just opened last month. And hopefully at some stage you can visit us. Uh, this is my email address here if anyone wants to contact me after the presentation. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Um, thank you, Professor Allen. Um, we're going to move straight on to our second part of the double act, uh, Professor William Chung. Uh, they have both um, uh, presenters have agreed to take questions at the end, so if you don't have anything, can we leave that till the end? Um, William. Thank you. Well, just to say that there are copies of the white paper and the care leaflets at the back of the room if you want to collect one and you haven't already got one. Thank you, Mick, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm William Chung from Hong Kong. Uh, I know that everybody hears a lot about Hong Kong these days uh, in the news, so it's not like my business to talk about Hong Kong here this afternoon. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit about myself first. Uh, I am a uh, full-time clinic in full-time clinical practice in Hong Kong, but I also have a teaching appointment with the University of Hong Kong Faculty of Dentistry, as well as uh, University of Pennsylvania School of Dental Medicine in Philadelphia. Um, but in addition, I'm also the vice chairman of the education committee of the FDI World Dental Federation. So all of you know that this is the World Dental Congress. It's a collaboration between uh, the American Dental Association and the FDI World Dental Federation uh, here in San Francisco. So I'm sure many of you are ADA members and you know a lot about the ADA. But my guess is uh, you probably don't know a lot about the FDI. So FDI for World Dental Federation is a, um, a global organization based in Geneva. And uh, we don't accept individual membership, uh, only association members. So ADA is a member of the FDI. And uh, we um, organize this uh, World Dental Congress every year in different uh, countries, different continents. Um, and uh, so this year is in San Francisco in collaboration with the ADA. Next year, we go to Shanghai, uh, co-organized with uh, the Chinese Stomatological Association. And then the following year, following year we go to Sydney uh, and uh, we uh, work with the uh, Australian Dental Association. And uh, so that's, this is uh, uh, something about the World Dental Congress. So. Uh, this morning, uh, I read in the ADA news that uh, there is over 28,000 registration uh, with this Congress, over 500 exhibitions. Uh, we have uh, put together a scientific program with over 200 speakers and uh, over 500 uh, different courses that you, should, you can choose from. So uh, these courses, uh, you know, uh, cover basically a broad spectrum of topics uh, within dentistry. So I would say that it's a pretty successful Congress. And of course, we have to thank you for your participation because without you, this can never be successful. And um, so I also uh, make a disclosure in what happened there. Uh, let's go back and see how we can fix this. Can someone get us? Oh, probably. Oh. Can someone get us the technician, possibly? 
No. Yeah, so it's just, it's, 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 it's not changing the thing, it's, just, it's got an internet, so it should be the other way around. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, um, I think you can still see the smaller screen, so I'll just continue until the technician gets here so that we don't uh, waste any time trying to fix this. Uh, also, uh, disclosure, no conflict of interest. And uh, this is going to be my presentation. Uh, I will uh, continue um, to build on what Professor Ellen has already uh, discussed earlier and um, uh, with a focus, more focus on, on the clinical aspect of what is this 3C concept and how do we, how do we apply that in our clinical practice. I need the slides. Or I can just uh, work from the screen. It's okay. You can do that? Yeah, I can work from the screen. I don't need the computer. How come it's completely off? Oh, there can we go. Just match? Yeah, it should. Okay, great. This is this is working now. Thank you. So um, first, I want to focus a little bit on our title, uh, the 3C pathway for, for managing the partially dentate patients. So Professor Ellen already described earlier, but uh, let me elaborate a little bit about the 3C concept. Uh, care, uh, he already said, we're caring for our patients. We are not just treating our patients. Uh, but what about continuum and collaborative? Uh, wh what does that mean? Because we're advocating uh, a th the three pillar concepts from pre-treatment assessment to treatment to post-treatment care. Uh, so it's a continuum. Rather than jumping right into a disease-driven model of treating the patient and replacing the missing tooth or missing teeth. So why is pre-treatment assessment so important? Uh, because we need to ask some questions and we need to address some issues that will eventually affect our treatment options, our treatment plan, but more importantly, the long-term care. How do we maintain this patient after we treat the patient? And a lot of the questions and the answers to, to these questions or uh, the, the, uh, the answer to, to these issues will determine uh, what treatment option is best for the patient. So it's not only a comprehensive care approach, but it's also a custom fit and cus customized, personalized plan uh, that we feel is best for the patient in terms of replacing the missing teeth and also in terms of maintaining this patient in the long run. Take for instance, why is a tooth missing? Is it because of disease? What kind of disease? Is it uh, caries? Is it periodontal disease? Uh, and we all know that someone with chronic period, periodontal disease is not the best candidate for implant treatment. So before you jump into the implant uh, replacement of a missing tooth of these candidates, we have to uh, perform a risk assessment. And then once we know what the risks are, then the next question is, can we lower the risk? Can we modify behavior so that if we offer this patient an implant, is it gonna last a long time? Or is the patient gonna come back to us in three or four years times and say, hey, I have a problem with the implant. So um, patient concerns and expectations are important too. Uh, we all know that some patients are concerned about a missing tooth and some patients are not so concerned about missing tooth. Uh, other patients may be concerned about the aesthetic outcome of whatever we, whatever we offer to them. Some have very high expectations some have not so high expectations. And it's good to find out before we start treatment because by the time we finish and we don't meet the expectations, then uh, it may be a disaster. And uh, so uh, it's good to set realistic expectations as well. And uh, so general health assessment, I don't need to tell you, a lot of oral systemic link, uh, diabe diabetes, uh, those patients who are osteoporosis on 
certain type of medications uh, we need to pay special attention to. Uh, do the patient need prophylactic antibiotics coverage? Uh, do they have, are they, a lot of patients nowadays are on anticoagulant therapy, and we need to know that uh, ahead of time. Uh, so along with that, uh, clinical and radiographic examinations obviously uh, make a difference uh, in our treatment plan. So there's a lot of uh, assessment and after these assessments and we need to communicate to the patient, you know, and uh, so this communication and uh, offering a reason why do we want to treat and how do we treat uh, is all part of the treatment plan. And that's the reason why the word collaborative is there because we're, we have diff there are different stakeholders. It's not just us and the patient, different stakeholders uh, in this whole uh, treatment plan. And then uh, once we're there, then we can uh, offer uh, different treatment options, uh, which is best for the, for the patient. And I won't elaborate now because I'm going to go into that a little bit more uh, later, later on. And then uh, finally, then we can decide on uh, a specific treatment plan that is best for the patient. And then uh, in that process, we may also want to consider referring the patient to the specialists whether it's endodontic treatment, periodontal treatment, or uh, surgical treatment, implant, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so there's another stakeholder or more than one stakeholders that's coming into the picture. So that's uh, uh, another reason why we call this process collaborative care. Um, and last but not the least, uh, long-term maintenance, extremely important. And we need to take that into consideration even in the very beginning, when we treatment plan for the patient, we need to tell the patient uh, that, look, everything that we do for you, we hope will last a long, long time, but they don't always last a long, long time. So when they fail, what happens? How do we manage failure? So again, this is just about setting expectations so that they don't think that once we finish our, our treatment, then everything is gonna be good until they die. And it's not gonna happen, you and I all know that. And uh, so um, this customized, personalized maintenance care concept is also very important. And uh, so it's, it's really about uh, dentist-patient partnership. And uh, so it's a, this personalized approach is extremely important in order to bring the patient on board with us so that they take ownership of this treatment plan. And if they do, then a lot of times we see better compliance and uh, restorations or the treatment that we offer do last longer. So this patient-centered approach is not about just filling the space, okay? The best analogy I can think of is personal training. So um, I go to the gym every morning from Monday to Friday. Uh, I work on the, uh, the different cardio machines 30 minutes every day before I go to work. And then in addition, uh, I also use a personal trainer twice a week, one hour each. And uh, he helps me with uh, a lot of weight training and stretching and all that. And uh, I find it extremely helpful, by the way, many of you, most of you are dentists in the room. And, and you know that after I've been practicing for uh, over 30, 30, 35 years, and there's a lot of neck and shoulder problem and chronic back pain and all that. And since I started personal training, I feel a lot better. So if you're not doing it, I would encourage you to seriously consider taking on uh, some exercise and especially personal training. So uh, I started personal training about 10 years ago. And the first time I met my trainer, he spent about 15, 20 minutes sitting down with me, asking me a lot of questions. How old am I? What is my medical health? What kind of medications I'm taking? Uh, what are my physical limitations? So I was born with scoliosis. So uh, that limits my mobility to some extent. Fortunately, it's not a serious condition. So that's the reason why I can still practice dentistry for the last 35 years. Um, I had a shoulder injury uh, about uh, 15 years ago. And that shoulder injury also limits some mobility of my left shoulder. Fortunately, it's not the right shoulder because I'm right-handed. Uh, and then I used to play a lot of tennis and that gives me a lot of trouble with my knees. And so I stopped playing tennis a number of years ago and I started picking up golf now, and, uh, which is a much, much milder exercise. <clears throat> but um, after this discussion with my trainer, uh, he, he knows he's aware, aware of my limitations. And then 
Uh, he asked me, so what do you expect out of this training program? So that's important too. My concerns, my expectations, and then he customized a training program for me, specific, specifically designed uh, for me. Okay, so it's tailor-made training program. And that's the reason why, uh, since I started picking up personal training, I feel a lot better. And uh, so this is the same analogy uh, that, uh, that we're, we're talking about here, uh, the same concept. Uh, every patient is different, and therefore, there is no standard formula. If you're missing a tooth here, we're gonna give you an implant. If you're missing multiple teeth, we're gonna, we're gonna give you a partial denture. So, uh, so it's a personalized approach. So uh, let's take a look at the, uh, I think the Professor Ellen has already covered the pre-treatment uh, assessment extensively. And I talked about it a little bit earlier. So I'm gonna pick up on the overview of treatment options. So what are some of the options that are available to us uh, while we are um, uh, looking at a patient with missing tooth or missing teeth? The first one obviously is to accept the missing tooth and maintain the residual dentition. Or sometimes we can do simple orthodontic movement to close the space and that's it, nothing else. And sometimes we use orthodontic treatment uh, to manage the missing tooth space so that we can eventually put in some either fixed restoration or removable restorations. Uh, Professor Ellen also talked extensively about the shortened dental arch or some patients don't like shortened dental arch. They want a complete set of dentition so that they feel better, they can chew better. And then last but not the least, in some cases, we may have to, con we ha we may have to consider uh, uh, an approach so-called control progression to edentulism. And I'll talk about that later. So accepting the missing tooth and maintaining the residu residual dentition, I think we've all seen cases like this, a missing first molar, patient decide it's not affecting my chewing ability, it's not an aesthetic concern, so I'm not gonna do anything about it. And then, um, but when it's missing an anterior tooth, that's an entirely different story. Most people would want to have that tooth replaced. Um, so uh, in fact, we find that 3% of, uh, of the patients will seek treatment when only the second molars are missing. But when it comes to first and second molars missing together, then over 50% of the patient will seek treatment. Um, obviously the problem with uh, not treating is that sometimes we see mesial drifting, uh, uh, migration of teeth, and then also over eruption and eventually causing some uh, posterior bite collapse, which makes future rehabilitation much more difficult. So that's something that we have to bear in mind and we have to inform the patient if they choose to go down this way. Um, but uh, the advantage is simple maintenance and obviously save patient money. And then orthodontic treatment, uh, sometimes, as I said earlier, can achieve the, the result that we are looking for. So, uh, instead of uh, filing down the teeth, uh, and then we can align the teeth for uh, other types of uh, rehabilitation. Uh, I will elaborate on this case. It's an interesting case. And uh, so uh, I will talk about that a little bit later. But uh, with orthodontic treatment, it requires longer treatment time, probably a little bit more expenses. And that's something that we need to discuss with the patient early on from the very beginning, just so that they're aware of it and that they are committed to it. Uh, with orthodontic treatment, we also see uh, the risk of caries development if they're not good with their oral hygiene, uh, and also the aggravation of periodontal disease, wood resorption, and so on and so forth. And therefore, we have to keep that in mind. Again, pretreatment risk assessment is important because we need to take a look at the patient's mouth and determine whether the patient is good with their oral hygiene. Are they committed to all good oral hygiene? Uh, are they experiencing high risk uh, with caries? Uh, if the answer to those questions are yes, then we need to take a closer look how we can reduce their risk, modify their behavior before we even recommend orthodontic treatment. Otherwise, by the time we finish the case, it's gonna be a disaster. We're gonna see increased caries and increased gum disease and, and, then, uh, and then we have to deal with those problems later on. So it's good to find out early. 
Uh, but obviously, uh, with orthodontic treatment, there's less damage to natural teeth and it's, it's much more conservative approach. Shorten dental arch, I would just uh, say very quickly because you already heard from Professor Allen earlier. Uh, as long as the patient is willing to accept some functional limitations. So uh, this patient I have seen for uh, over 25 years. And uh, the first moment I saw her, uh, she was without the second and the third molars. And she was functioning well uh, until recently. Uh, she lost this uh, uh, lower right first molar because the tooth was cracked. Uh, and um, so we decided to take the tooth out and just replace one with one implant. And she's been very happy with the shortened dental arch and that uh, she been, she's been functioning very well with the shortened dental arch with no complaint. So there's no reason why we should recommend additional implants, you know, here and there, uh, or even a removable partial denture, uh, because that would be ridiculous. Uh, for, for anterior, the situation is entirely different, obviously, because there's an aesthetic concern. Um, shortened dental arch, uh, Professor Ellen had already quoted a number of literature review that tells you that uh, uh, it's uh, equally acceptable to uh, the patient. So I don't need to elaborate. So uh, they do, uh, it does improve oral function to an acceptable level, simplifies maintenance, and also it's cheaper for the patient and also uh, reduce the biologic price of treatment, meaning that we don't have to uh, disturb uh, other teeth in order to replace the missing teeth. And uh, so, as I said earlier, uh, some patients prefer to have a complete dentition, no matter what. And I think you and I, if you practice long enough, you have seen those patients uh, because they feel like uh, if I don't, uh, it's going to be limit my function. And there's also some aesthetic impact if it's an anterior tooth. Um, so from the patient's per perspective, uh, they feel like uh, uh, they are better satisfied, uh, improve their oral function if it's a complete dentition. Uh, but uh, before we uh, begin launching uh, an elaborate treatment plan like that, we better make risk assessment, modify behavior, and then uh, if patients understand everything, we also have to tell the patient there is a long-term maintenance uh, you know, uh, commitment to this. Maintenance in terms of maintaining the restorations that we put in, make sure they perform good oral hygiene so that they will last longer. And not only that, there is a commitment that they have to be prepared uh, to make in, uh, when, the, when the restorations mm -hmm. fail, because these things do fail uh, over a long time. And uh, so a favorite, favorite uh, question when I say this to my patients is that, well, how long will they last? So what is the typical answer? We don't quote literature, seven years, eight years, no. How long do they last depends on how well you take care of it, okay? You and I are partners. It's my job to make sure that it's done properly. But once it's in your mouth, it's out of my control, right? So that kind of idea, that kind of concept has to be communicated to them right from the beginning before even we even start thinking about this type of restoration because it's very complicated, it's very elaborate, it costs them a lot of money. So we, we don't want them to come back in several years time and say, well, it's failed, so what am I gonna do now, All right? So it's better to talk about it uh, from, from the beginning. So it does improve oral function to the optimal level. So, I'm sure if we all practice long enough, we've seen these cases, disaster. And no matter how hard we try, no matter what we tell the patients, there is no compliance, poor oral hygiene, and you just continue that kind of lifestyle and that kind of uh, oral hygiene behavior. And uh, so in those situations, then we may have to consider this option of controlled progression to edentulism. We might, as well, uh, we might as well paint a realistic picture uh, for the patient. And uh, so, uh, so our responsibilities in these situations is re really just to reduce the pathogens, make sure that uh, there's no, uh, no acute disease in the mouth. Uh, the chronic disease will always be there, improve their comfort, okay? Make sure they are comfortable and that they can chew reasonably well. 
And then we tell the patient several years down the road, you may have to lose all the teeth and then we have to think about a plan how to restore the missing teeth. Uh, so one step at a time. So uh, I don't need to tell you this is a disaster, right? So the, when, the first pa uh, when the patient first came to see me, I look, at his, look in his mouth, I say, oh my goodness, uh, you name it, he's got it. Periodontal disease, uh, these teeth are just hanging there, uh, ready to fall out anytime. Uh, and then uh, uh, caries uh, along the uh, uh, margin of the existing restorations. And then the dentist he went to previously, I mean, it's not like this patient is not willing to invest in this mouth. I mean, look at all these expensive restorations that he has. He's got this, what, uh, eight unit bridge from here to here with five uh, lower incisors and then there's a space for one and then uh, there's another one there. So seven mandibular incisors. So I don't know what his dentist was, think was thinking about. And, uh, and uh, so he's, he's invested a lot of money in his mouth, okay? But it's a disaster because the reason is because there's no modification of behavior. There's no risk assessment in the beginning. And so whatever you put in that mouth, it's bound to fail, okay? And now it's failed. And now what? So what do we do? Well, the first thing we tell the patient is that you need to change your behavior. We need to do a risk assessment and then we need to modify your behavior. And uh, if you can, then we can offer you something nice. If you cannot, if we're not convinced that you can do what we expect you to do, then we're not going to offer you anything elaborate, such as this long bridge here, because in several years time, you're going to come back to me and say, well, it's failed, now what, right? So you're just going through, repeat the cycle, you know, from year to year. And uh, so uh, in, at the end of the day, we told him that uh, we will try to save whatever can be saved. Okay, and then we're going to put in some transitional restorations to make sure that you're comfortable, you can chew comfortably, and then we're going to watch you for a while. And uh, so this is what we offered him in the end. We replaced the failed restorations. We have no option. There are crowns already, so we can't go back to natural teeth. And then we took out the, the hopeless teeth, and then we gave him two removable partial dentures as a transition. And then we watch him. Okay, we monitor him. Uh, and uh, sadly, uh, the patient uh, came back for several maintenance visits and then he disappeared. So I don't have any story to tell you what happened to him afterwards. But that's typical of these patients because uh, if you try to, try to convince him that he needs to do something more at home and it's, ah, it's too much trouble and then you go somewhere else. So out of those five options, which one is the most relevant one? Well, it depends on the oral health status of the patient uh, in terms of uh, caries and periodontal disease. Sometimes we may have to make a, a risk assessment for the patient. So there is, um, again, Professor Ellen already uh, told you about caries risk assessment, uh, where we identify a number of risk factors, protective factors, along with clinical findings. And then we determine whether the patient is low risk, moderate risk, or high risk. And uh, once we've made that determination, then we can communicate to the patient, you are high risk for caries. And there are some things that you can do to lower the risk if you're willing to work with us. And we will, we will provide some, some uh, recommendations for you. And then in terms of periodontal disease, uh, Professor Lang and Professor Tonetti also came up with this periodontal risk assessment uh, protocol. Uh, again, we identify risk factors, some modifying factors, along with clinical findings, low risk, moderate risk, and high risk. And, um, uh, you know, uh, I had said this before, uh, patients who are, who are high risk for periodont periodontitis are also high risk for periimplantitis. So remember that. Um, I, um, motivation and patient participation extremely important, especially if we're going to put together a very comprehensive and elaborate and complicated treatment plan. We've got to bring them on board. They have to be motivated. Otherwise, we're just asking for disaster. And their willingness to take, and take on a complex treatment over time. Uh, treatment like orthodontic treatment, implant treatment, 
costs a lot of money, takes a long time to, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to finish, and they have to be motivated, have to, have to be willing to do it. Uh, different cultures have different norms and values, I don't need to tell you. And then last but not the least, initial cost is important to consider. However, the long-term maintenance cost is equally important to consider. And when I say long-term maintenance cost, I don't mean just buying toothbrushes and toothpaste and dental floss and interdental brushes. I mean, when these restorations fail in the future, they have to be committed to either repair or replace. And that costs a lot of money as well. And they need to know that ahead of time. So let's move on to uh, the second item overview of technologies available. And I don't need to explain the different technologies that are available uh, right now to the profession. I think you're all very familiar with these different options. Uh, for fixed partial denture, uh, traditionally we call them fixed bridge, either fixed fix, fixed removable or cantilever. The cantilever design can work uh, this case that I'm illustrating here on the bottom, uh, X-ray radiograph, has been in the patient's mouth for over 20 years. I put, it, I put it in when the patient was in her 50s, and now the patient is in her 70s. And this X-ray was taken recently. And then you look at the radiograph, look at the bone level, still very optimal for a 70-odd-year-old lady. Uh, not bad, no complaints, right? And uh, so uh, we designed a very small pontic uh, because she was, not, she was not ready to accept a missing tooth in that position. And plus she has a uh, opposing tooth on top. And uh, so we don't want that tooth to migrate or over erupt. Uh, very meticulous with her oral hygiene, very compliant patient. We asked her to come back every six months. She comes back every six months on time. And that's the reason why the restoration is still there after 20 years. And uh, so uh, as long as the supporting teeth are sound, uh, case selection, patient selection is extremely important in terms of a cantilever bridge. Uh, the downside of a fixed bridge, we all know we have to file down the abutment teeth and sometimes we cause pulp damage in the long run. And then after a couple of times of bridge replacement, you guarantee that the patient will have to see the endodontist uh, for root canal treatment. And once these abutments are root treated, they become much weaker. And you know what happened? You put another bridge there, several years down the road, they are gonna come back and see you, the teeth broke, you know? So what happens now? So you might as well tell the patient advance, uh, in advance before you put another bridge on these endodontically treated abutments that, well, these are very weak teeth. They are not ideal for a fixed bridge anymore. So you may want to consider different options at this time rather than later, okay? So at the end of the conversation and the discussion, if they still say, well, no, I don't want implant, I don't want implant, just give me another bridge because they've had this bridge for a long time already. So they have this preconcept that the bridge will work for many years. So let's see how it goes. That's fine. As long as they are informed, so when it happens, they're not surprised, right? And um, so the other downside of these fixed bridges is it's difficult to clean underneath the pontic. And we've seen it over and over. People who are not committed to good oral hygiene, uh, these, these bridges will fail, right? And uh, so that's the reason why it's important to talk about maintenance at this point in the beginning. So you've got to maintain it. You've got to be committed to, you know, to keep it clean, otherwise it's gonna fail. Uh, for the cantilever uh, uh, arrangement, obviously, uh, the downside is the rotation of failure because of unfavorable leverage on the forces. And that's why it's important uh, to uh, select the right case and the right patient. Um, uh, but the benefits of uh, having these fixed bridges is it's more comfortable. It is more comfortable compared to a removable prosthesis. And it, it can offer good aesthetics uh, and in this case, uh, these two are pontics, and then uh, it's uh, uh, retained by uh, the two lateral incisors. And they do look very nice and very comfortable. So to apply the 3C concept, okay, the three pillars of pre-treatment assessment, uh, treatment, as well as post-treatment care. So I'm going, to, I'm going to share this case with you. 
Uh, chief complaint, 64 year old male. Chief complaint is recurrent gum abscess on the upper left molar. And if you look at the radiograph, it's easy to understand why. Uh, it's got a six, seven millimeter pocket there. Uh, difficult for patient to, to maintain because the pontic is right there. Okay, so even if you can get the floss through there, it's, there's no way that you can floss into the six to seven millimeter pocket on the mesial of this tooth, of this molar. And it's, in addition, it's endodontically treated, not the best abutment for a fixed bridge. Nevertheless, he's had this bridge for a number of years, and now the gum disease is getting worse. He has a similar kind of situation on the upper right, uh, the opposing side. Uh, and uh, he was experiencing this kind of problem approximately 10 years ago. And then at that point in time, uh, we've decided after thorough discussion and exploring the different alternatives with the patient, uh, we've decided to put in, put in a four unit bridge, extract the second molar and do a fixed bridge from uh, the second premolar uh, to the third molar. Uh, now, Honestly, it's not an ideal treatment plan, okay? And we made it very clear to the patient. Uh, but the good thing about this patient is he's very compliant. He's committed to cleaning, uh, maintaining his mouth. And uh, we ask him to come back every three months and he comes back every three months. And so after 10 years, the bridge, the four unit bridge on the upper right side is still there in his mouth and doing well. And so when this happens on the left side, on the opposing side, uh, we took a look at it and he's uh, uh, medically healthy, only on Lipitor and Cardia for some early cardi cardiovascular disease and high, uh, high cholesterol. He does exhibit uh, evidence of bruxism and we already made him a night guard a long time ago and he's faithfully wearing the night guard. So we classify him as stage two generalized stage three localized grade B periodontitis. This is the new classification of periodontal disease. Compliant, as I said, and willing to explore all options because it's been 10 years since he's had that bridge on the upper right side. And he told me, well, after 10 years, you guys must have something better and easier in terms of an implant, right? I said, well, let's take a look. So we, Actually, when I saw this, I already knew there's nothing easy and simple for him. But I said, well, let's explore it, okay? So we took a cone beam CT, and then on the cone beam CT, you can see how the pontic area, bone level, is paper thin. There's virtually no bone there. And it's very similar in the area where he has this recurrent abscess uh, with the upper left second molar. And uh, you can also see this, uh, this buildup of cloudy appearance uh, in the sinus because of the chronic periodontal disease that he's been experiencing. So at the end of the day, uh, we told him, well, we could, put, we, we could extract the tooth and uh, uh, do extensive bone augmentation for you. And then hopefully it works and, and then we can put a couple of implants in there. But I said, uh, hopefully, the word hopefully means that, look, building bone in that area can be very challenging and it doesn't always work, okay? We have an oral surgeon in our practice, so we consult with the oral surgeon and he says the same thing. We'll do our best to give you, offer you bone, but sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So there's no guarantee. And the other option is to extract the tooth, uh, wait for wind healing to take place, and then we'll make you a four unit bridge, just like the opposite side, which you've had for the past 10 years. So after explaining all of that, and I think you can guess what the, what the decision from the patient is. He says, well, just take it out and I'll have a four unit bridge. And that's fine with us. As long as he knows the pros and cons, the decision, is made together with the patient. So he's on board with us, okay? So he takes ownership of this treatment plan. And then, uh, so we extract the two seven, make a four unit bridge and uh, encourage him to continue to wear the night guard. And then, more importantly, instructions on how to maintain the bridge or bridges, one left and one right side. And then uh, wear his night guard. Uh, overall home care and regular three monthly hygiene uh, maintenance. 
And uh, so uh, I said in the beginning, he's very a very compliant patient, and uh, so I'll, um, and uh, he, he will come back every three months, and hopefully we can maintain this bridge for a long, long time. So resin bonded bridge uh, again, case selection is extremely important. They do work. So this patient has been wearing this uh, resin bonded bridge from uh, central to lateral to the canine. This is the Pontic. And that's been in her mouth for over 25 years. Okay. Anterior works better than posterior because of it's not as stress bearing. Uh, and it only works a short span. Okay. So don't be too ambitious. So the downside is that um, Decementation can take place, chipping of the porcelain, and the graying of the uh, abutment with the metal wing uh, at the back, uh, such as this one here. But it is less destructive, more conservative, and again, it can work, but case selection is important. And also, case selection means patient selection. So this particular patient is, again, a very compliant patient. And uh, one thing that I'm very proud of my practice is a lot of my patients are very compliant patients because we spend a lot of time educating the patient, stressing the importance of maintenance, stressing, stressing the importance of uh, returning to us on a regular basis. And many of them uh, do listen to us. And uh, uh, so this can be a, a more conservative approach compared to grinding down the teeth and and uh, uh, making a fixed uh, bridge. Removable partial denture can replace multiple missing teeth. That's the, the nice thing about it. And uh, it can, uh, especially on a free end saddle uh, situation, and it can, it can even restore defects in the alveolar bone and gingiva. Uh, and the denture can be modified uh, in some cases in the future if the patient loses more teeth. So those are the advantages. Uh, but in the case that I showed you earlier, we also use it uh, for a, as a transitional prosthesis while we plan for future treatment. Um, but the risk is uh, the stability of the denture depends on retention. Okay, if it's better retained, then yes, uh, it can it can offer more re better retention, more stability. Uh, but um, wearing partial denture can increase the risk of caries and periodontal disease. And uh, a lot of patients cannot tolerate the prosthesis in the mouth, and therefore they don't wear it. Poor patient compliance. <clears throat> uh, but it's relatively low cost, easier to make, uh, even in a uh, 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 low tech environment. So another case that I want to share with you, uh, again, it's a disaster. <laughs> when the patient first came to see me, and I was stunned when I looked into the, into the mouth. Uh, obviously, all kinds of oral diseases, you name it, he has it, okay? Periodontal disease, pretty severe. Uh, you see the caries there, uh, broken teeth, missing teeth. Uh, it, problem, problem. And uh, so he's 68 years old, uh, surprisingly, only on hypertension medication and is well controlled and um, so his chief complaint uh, was loose teeth with pain. I have pain in my mouth. So where do you have pain? I have pain all over, <laughs> and which you can understand. Uh, so uh, what are you expecting? Again, trying to disclose patients' concerns and expectations. And uh, so I would like to have more teeth so that I can chew. Uh, and I like to keep as many teeth as possible, but I don't want implants. So he said it right up front. I don't want implants because I don't like surgery in my mouth. So, okay, we listen to that. Uh, diagnosis was in addition to caries, stage two to three generalized grade B periodontitis. Poor oral hygiene. I don't need to tell you. You can see for, for yourself. And in addition, he loves sweets. Okay, so that adds uh, 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 even more problem for us to, to manage. So we uh, did a full comprehensive examination, radiograph, study models, you name it. And then um, I spent about uh, 30, 45 minutes sitting down with the patient and tell him. We did a risk assessment, high caries risk, high periodontal risk, 
okay, patient. And so we told him about these risks. I said, but we can modify the risks if you are committed, if you are ready and willing to modify your behavior, okay? Um, so that's on the risk assessment side. And then we have to tell him some of these teeth have to come out because they are hopeless. We can't do anything about them. Uh, and then we told him how many teeth that have to come out. And then at the end of the day, uh, we can uh, offer him something uh, transitional and watch that for a while. Uh, but he will be comfortable with chewing. He will have more teeth to chew with. Um, uh, the disease will be under control, uh, but whether he's going to return to disease or not will depend on what he does uh, along with what we do. And uh, so he was reasonably happy with that approach. And so in the end, uh, we decided to extract the hopeless teeth, temporary removable denture, refer him to see our periodontist for uh, periodontal treatment, and then we'll offer him a bunch of oral hygiene instructions, how to maintain his mouth, root canal therapy on some of the teeth uh, because they are grossly decayed. But if they can be saved, if they can be restored, then uh, we offer him root canal treatment. And then um, some fixed bridges and on the upper anterior and the lower anterior because he wants good looking teeth in addition to teeth to chew with. And then removable partial denture on upper and lower posterior. So this is the finished case. I think you'd all agree that disease is under control and then we replace some missing teeth so that he can function with and he looks decent. So he was very happy, but we reiterated the importance of post-treatment care and maintenance. If you're not committed to maintaining what we've offered you, it's going to fail. We guarantee him that it's going to fail. And so uh, along with that, uh, you can see high fluoride toothpaste with dietary advice because he loves sweets. So we made it plenty clear to him the difference between frequency and quantity. Okay, that's my favorite story to my patients too. Those who love sweet, I, can, I, t I tell my patients, you can have 10 candies a day, but have them all at once. Don't spread them out, okay? You, you, if, even if you're willing to cut down to five, but you spread them out between from uh, breakfast and lunch and dinner, and then you don't brush your teeth in between. So your teeth, your mouth stay sweet the whole time, all day long, every day. So I will give you 10, double the amount, okay? But you have them all at once. And then after that, please go brush your teeth, rinse your mouth, right? And that's better than having only five. Right? So I think the point that we're trying to communicate is that it's not the quantity that we're talking about. It's the frequency of sweet intake. That's important. So we made that plenty clear to, to, to her, to, to him, I'm sorry. So implants, I don't need to tell you. Everybody is doing implant. Everybody loves implant. And there's, there are good reasons why we love implants, okay? Uh, it can be used uh, wherever there is bone or wherever we can do bone augmentation. And uh, implants can support a variety of prostheses, whether it's a single crown or a fixed bridge or overdenture. And uh, uh, obviously we can expect uh, good, you know, improved quality of life. Uh, and we can expect, uh, you know, good aesthetics if it's done properly. Uh, and good results. But a lot of patients are afraid of surgery. They don't, they don't want implant. And I, we see it over and over again in our practice. People come in uh, and tell you right from the start, I don't want implant. I said, but it, we've been doing it for 30 years. Success rate can be above 95%. No, I don't want implant. Uh, and then there's another problem that we need to bear in mind. And that is they have high expectations. From, from implant and rightly because they pay a lot of money for implants. So their expectations are high. So patients tend to overestimate functions and longevity and underestimate the expertise needed to carry out the implant treatment. So keep that in mind. And therefore, it's even more important for us to communicate clearly and set realistic expectations before we start implant treatment. Okay, um, 
The main risk, there are three different categories of risk, general risk, periimplantitis disease. We spent, uh, our profession spent uh, very busy putting in implants for the last two decades. And now we're gonna be very busy trying to treat periimplantitis, okay? Because we're seeing more and more of these complications coming up. So uh, we've said it once, we've said it twice, and I'm gonna say it again. Patients who are susceptible to periodontitis are equally susceptible to periimplantitis. Just keep that in mind. Better survival in mandible than maxillar and bone augmentation does increase the complexity of your treatment. Surgical risk, lower survival rate in smokers. So we need to, we need to find out. Heavy smokers are not ideal candidates for implants. And if they have periodontal disease on top of uh, being a heavy smoker, that's even worse. So other risk groups, uh, osteonecrosis on certain types of medication, we've dealt with uh, problems uh, with people taking osteonecrosis medications uh, with this type of uh, uh, um, osteonecrosis of the jaw, and, uh, and it's very difficult to treat. Uh, poorly controlled diabetics, uh, another reason why we have to monitor the medical health condition of, of these patients very carefully to make sure they are suitable for surgery. And obviously the risk of damage to uh, nerve. Uh, prosthetic risk, there are several, chipping veneer, loosening of the screws and the cementation of the, of the cement retained crowns, implant crowns along with implant fracture and uh, screw fracture. So we need to be prepared to deal with those complications. Uh, it can be predictable if case selection is proper, properly done, and can offer good aesthetics. You know, look at this implant and it's uh, the crown there. Uh, it's, it, it can offer very good aesthetics. So I had a, uh, we had our uh, World Dental Congress in Buenos Aires uh, last year, and I had the privilege and honor of chairing a session by Professor Klaus Lang uh, he's, I think, well, uh, well recognized as one of the top periodontists and, and uh, one of the top implantologists in the world. And uh, one of the things that he said that, that stick in my mind is that implant is not intended to replace any tooth, but the missing tooth. Keep that in mind. So if the tooth can be saved, whether it's because of periodontal disease or decay, tooth decay, if the tooth can be safe with conventional periodontal treatment, with root canal treatment and a proper restoration, don't rush into taking the tooth out so, and put an implant in there. That's not what implants are for. Implants are for the missing tooth, not for any tooth. I think there's a lot of wisdom in that <clears throat> uh, sentence. Uh, orthodontic. Um, we can uh, close the space to align the teeth that facilitate other types of restoration, but the downside is caries and periodontal disease. I don't need to elaborate anymore. And uh, sometimes we can achieve clinical outcomes uh, without operative intervention, and then it can improve the option for further care. So I wanna share this case with you. I told you there's gonna be very clinically focused. So another case, 35 year old female, uh, quite a good-looking, attractive young lady. And her complaint was loose baby teeth. I've had these baby teeth uh, all my life and uh, they are getting loose. So if you take a look at the maxillary arch, she's missing the premolars. There's no premolars there. This is a permanent canine. This is a deciduous canine. Same thing on the opposite side. Permanent canine, deciduous canine. But look at this crowded anterior teeth with protrusion. And then you look at the space for these deciduous canine, quite narrow, you can see it from the side, quite narrow, very small space, right? But then she told us, she's medically healthy, she told us, I don't want implant, okay? Which is quite unusual for a younger individual. But she said up front, I don't want implants. And I don't want orthodontic treatment either. She said, I've had this bridge on the lower right side for many years and it's working very well. Can you just remove these baby teeth for me and make me a fixed bridge? I said, oh no. 
She's only 35 years old. How many times do you think she's going to have to repeat this fixed bridge? And also, look at these abutments. Perfectly healthy teeth. Okay? And I honestly cannot tolerate filing down those teeth and offer her a fixed bridge. Okay, we can consider a Maryland bridge or a resin retained bonded bridge, but again, it's not ideal in this location. Okay, so uh, I did a full workup and then I sat down with her and convinced her that she should seriously consider orthodontic treatment, if not implant. We can talk about implant later, one step at a time. First, orthodontic treatment. Why? Because we can take out these very loose baby teeth on both sides and retract those upper front teeth and align them properly and also uh, rotate this canine and move this a little bit more buckly. And then that may be the end of treatment. We don't have to touch any of your natural teeth. We save you the expenses of filing down those teeth, biological price that you have to pay in order to make a fixed bridge. And we also save you long-term maintenance costs because you're going to have to repeat that bridge from time to time. How many years? I cannot guarantee. I cannot tell you. But it's not going to last a lifetime. So which approach do you think is better? So again, this comprehensive personalized care plan for the patient. And in the end, I'm happy to report to you that she accepted my recommendation. So she's going through orthodontic treatment now, and I'm extremely happy because I don't have to file down those perfectly healthy teeth on both sides. Four teeth, can you imagine? And we have to do it over and over again. And so treatment plan, prophylaxis, or hygiene instruction, always orthodontic consultation, extracting those baby teeth, and then close the space and correct the crowding of the upper anterior teeth, uh, and, uh, and also the upper, uh, up to, oh, also to upright the molar. I forgot to explain to you the bottom, uh, the bottom situation. So the, uh, on, the mandib on the mandible, she has a fixed bridge on the right side, but a space that she's been having for a long, long time without replacement. I don't know why. Maybe because she thinks that, well, I can chew comfortably on the right side and on the left side, nobody can see. So that's okay. I'm functioning okay. And there's no aesthetic concerns, even though she's a beautiful young lady. And uh, you can also see the uh, over eruption of the permanent canine on the left side because of the missing tooth. And uh, so we asked the orthodontist to upright the molar uh, we section off uh, this bridge here and ask them to upright the molar on this side. And then eventually, I'm going to con try to convince her to explore the possibility of implants. She already has a bridge on the right side, so we don't have to worry about grinding down healthy good teeth. But on the, uh, on the right side, on the left side, these are again, perfectly healthy natural teeth. I just hate to grind them down to give her a fixed bridge. So we'll see what happens. This is work in progress. She's still going through orthodontic treatment. So we'll see what happens out of the uh, communication later. Because I promise her, we'll do it one step at a time. You don't have to uh, decide on implant right away. So eventually we want to have orthodontic retention, maintenance, whether it's implant or fixed bridges and then hygiene, uh, instructions and uh, uh, regular recall. So the other option is a combination. We can do orthodontic treatment and bridge, orthodontic treatment and resin bond bridge, orthodontic treatment and removable partial denture, implants and uh, overdenture, whatever combination is best suitable for the patient. So um, we're doing good with time. Uh, I think I'm just gonna take another maybe five or 10 minutes and I will wrap up everything. Preparatory care, the importance of preparing the patient for treatment, extremely important. We've talked about assessing the overall health condition because it can make a difference in our treatment plan and our post-operative care. Uh, we have to obtain patient ownership to this treatment plan. The better we do it, the better compliance we can get from the patient. 
uh, ensure stability of primary diseases such as caries and periodontal disease. If we don't get that, whatever we offer to the patient will fail and probably will fail faster than you anticipate. And assess compliance, cooperation to review the risk. In some situations, we may have to go through the risk assessment test, whether it's caries assessment or periodontal risk assessment. And then review the definitive care plan, rehabilitation, and the importance of long-term maintenance. And finally, we can secure patient informed consent. And then once we have secured the informed consent, then can, we can move on to definitive care phase and uh, implement uh, the treatment. But it's also important to remember, know when to refer. Okay, I'm a general dentist and I'll be one very honest with you. There's a lot of things that I don't know how to do. I don't do orthodontic treatment, none at all. I don't do anything that's surgical. Simple extraction I do, but I don't place implants. I don't take out third molars, you know, impacted third molars. And uh, I'm happy that I'm working with a periodontist in my practice and we have an oral surgeon in my practice. We have an endodontist in my practice. And so I do a lot of referrals, okay? Things that I feel that I have limitations, I'm not afraid to refer. And I think it's in the best interest of our patients. That's why it's collaborative care. Uh, however, the final decision should be based on the education, training, and experience of the referring dentist and the specialists, as well as the specific needs of the patient. So it's a multi-stakeholder uh, type of arrangement that uh, we have to uh, take into consideration. And the referring dentist is responsible for leading and coordinating definitive care and long-term care and maintenance of the patient. Okay, so we are res responsible ultimately. Even if when we refer to the specialists, there's room for discussion, especially for implants. We find it over and over again. Uh, what type of implants do we decide? Where is it going to place? Because it's going to affect your prosthetic tre uh, treatment later on. So you have to have this communication with your, uh, with your surgeon if you, if you don't do it yourself. So finally, the importance of long-term care. Long-term care, again, is a personalized plan. Okay, And then um, the reason why it's personalized is because uh, Greek plaque control is, is important, but every patient has a different disease risk. So what type of maintenance plan we offer to the patient will depend on the risk that they are exposed to. There is no standard formula that every patient comes back every six months. No. Some patients we want to see every three months. Others we may want to see every month, depending on their risk level, and their behavior, how well they do in their home care. And we have to tell the patient that there will be need for mechanical maintenance and repairs in some of the work that we do for you, and you have to be prepared for that. All restorations have a lifespan and they may need to be replaced. Okay, we might as well tell them upfront so that they are prepared for it. In terms of patient education, uh, oral hygiene instructions, again, is specific to the treatment, type of treatment that you are offering to the patient. Uh, there has to be risk awareness uh, specific to the treatment that we perform. And uh, when we put in the bridge, we tell the patient what are some of the uh, specific uh, risks that they are exposed to and so that they can uh, look out for them and they, they can be more careful in terms of minimizing those risks treatment lifespan, we already said, and how do we manage failure? Important to discuss uh, at the time of putting in this, these uh, restorations. So uh, I'm sure all of us are doing implant restorations, and I'm sure all, all of us have experienced uh, how we put in an implant crown in the beginning, the contacts are tight, and then after two or three months, they come back and tell you, oh, I'm getting a lot of food trap. So for some reason, the contact has opened up, right? And then uh, after a couple of years, they may come back to you and tell you, uh, 
the crown, the implant that you, you made for me is feeling loose. Yes, we've all experienced that because the screw is loose. So there's a lot of advantage of doing a screw retained implant versus a cement retained implant. Screw retained implant you can fix very easily. Cement is a problem. And um, so these things will happen. So you might as well tell the patient when you deliver the prosthesis so that they are mentally and psychologically prepared for these things to happen. So I tell them right from the beginning, the screw is a screw retained prosthesis. The screw may get loose after you know functioning for a while. And when that happens, call us right away and we'll fix it. It's very easy to fix and it doesn't cost you anything. Okay, then they will call you. So that's what I mean by preparing the patient. So in summary, this concept of 3C, pre-treatment assessment, uh, I'm sorry, continue, uh, collaborative care continuum, extremely important. The three pillars, pre-treatment assessment to treatment, moving on to post-treatment care in order to get better ownership from the patient and better compliance. More importantly, longer survival of whatever treatment that you offer to the patient. Personalized care. There's no one size fits all. Every patient is different, every situation is different, and therefore your treatment plan is different and your management, long-term management is different. Patient-dentist communication, extremely important. You know, from risk assessment level uh, perspective, as well as um, uh, 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 patient buying into the treatment plan. Patient education, extremely important. Once the case is finished, we need to emphasize and re-emphasize and re-emphasize the importance of long-term maintenance uh, through patient education and financial mechanisms. Uh, uh, Professor Allen mentioned earlier that um, we advocate uh, a lot of patient communication, doing these pre-treatment assessments, explaining to the patient why we need to treat them, how we need to treat them. Do we get reimbursed? I don't know, different countries work differently. If not, then you need to work with your national dental associations and figure out a way that you can get it reimbursed. Either that, or you increase your fee of treatment to cover those, the time that, that, that you spend with the patient uh, pre-treatment. Uh, and also it's good to explain the financial commitment ahead of time, especially in complicated treatment plan. There's no, no sense of arguing about fees after everything is finished. Uh, they need to know and have a commitment uh, in terms of what kind of financial commitment that they were making and that they will pay you accordingly. So uh, I think we have prepared uh, a package of documents for you to take home. A white paper is a 23 page, very comprehensive document. Uh, everything that we talk about today is in that booklet. Along with that, there's this uh, uh, patient leaflet on the left side, uh, some oral hygiene tips for your patients and also preparing them for um, you know, their dentist appointment. Uh, and then on the, on the right side is a professional chairside guide, which is comprehensive in terms of the different treatment options, the pros and cons, uh, as well as different technologies that you can use to treat these patients. And I hope that you enjoy these documents. It's produced by the FDI. With that, I thank you for your patience and uh, for your attention. Thank you, Professor Chun. That was excellent. Um, we do have a one minute for um, questions. If you can make your way to the microphone, uh, if you wish to ask a question. Uh, I can see a few guilty faces. I just want to reassure you from personal experience that it is possible to have a 35 year career without going anywhere near a personal trainer. <laughs> it's never too late to start. Uh, come on, is there any questions? For me, I think the communication thing is key. Please. So, my question is could you? Uh, walk us through the principle behind um, uh, working towards uh, edentialism finally and the transition stage of it. Uh, if 
as you say upon uh, initial assessment that it was a disaster, what is the point of having a transition stage where you observe them and keep them uh, comfortable when eventually they will lose their teeth anyway? Okay, um, I think part of it is to make sure that we modify behavior because if we rush into taking the teeth out, um, unless we're talking about full dentures, but if you offer any implant retain prosthesis, without modifying behavior, uh, assessing the risks and monitor the risks, eventually uh, those type of treatment will fail. So um, sometimes patients are not ready to have all of their teeth out all at once, you know, they want to hang on to whatever they can hang on to. So the, another advantage of that is to, um, first of all, clean up the mouth, control disease so that everything is stable. We take out whatever is hopeless, really cannot keep, then we take them out. And then we give them a transitional denture so that they can chew comfortably or reasonably comfortably. Uh, they look decent uh, and then we monitor them instead of rushing into a permanent type of restoration. How long is the transition? Depends on the patient. It could be years? It could be years, it could be a few months. Yeah. I think that I would add to that, that there's a certain category of patient that you recognize these, they are gonna lose all of their teeth. And it's a question of uh, timing when that's gonna happen. So I think the first step with it is is to signal that to them that, that this is definitely going the wrong direction and it's going to end up with total tooth loss. So rather than sitting on that fence, as I said in my presentation, waiting then and the whole lot come out at one go, it's better to do that over a transitional phase. Now that, that, that to a certain extent, the length of that depends on the extent of the disease at the given time that you see this patient first. Uh, um, but in likelihood, it's probably going to be over three to four years in my experience. Um, so it starts with removing the hopeless teeth first, uh, tidying things up a little bit, but not worrying too much if you're going to get a cessation of disease, you probably won't. Um, providing them with, and, and it's important to provide a well-designed traditional denture. If it's a really bad denture, just chucked into the spaces, it will put the patient off completely. So you have to have it well designed and using good principles and then gradually add to it. I would just say I uh, have two well designed dentures so that in the transition phase you can work on one and the patient can work on one and they're not going out and you've warned them about that before you start. Any more questions? Okay. Um, do you want to do the CPD? Yes, please. Well, thank you both, uh, Doctors Allen and Chung, for a very informative session and for the white paper. We totally appreciate that. And now I have the CE verification code. Please keep this code secure since you are going to need it to verify the uh, CE credits, which you can obtain and at ADA events mobile app or through ada.org slash verify CE. The code is 1329. The course number that we just finished was 5163 and the verification code once again is 1329. Thank you for attending the course and enjoy the rest of your time at the ADA FDI World Dental Conference.